Um, well, I'm going to get up here and make some ex cathedra statements, just like Mark did. Um, but um, uh, the, I'm going to cloak them in the literature, okay? I'm going to um, use uh, animal studies, um, in vitro studies, um, to uh, uh, d demonstrate my rationale for doing some of the things I do. Maybe logical or illogical, I'll let you decide. Um, the, uh, I think first before we discuss uh, short bowel syndrome, uh, we need to discuss the, um, the uh, prevalence of, uh, of uh, short bowel syndrome and, and the etiology of short bowel syndrome. And um, then we'll go on to some of the pathophysiology, uh, some of the, the um, uh, medical strategies that I use, um, uh, surgical, non-transplant surgical options and then transplant, and then I have a few questions, a few, um, uh, couple of cases to present. Um, um, well, <coughs> uh, Jane Ballant um, uh, did uh, sort of a meta-analysis of uh, uh, 13 series of um, 436 patients that compiled from 72 to 2000, and she found at that time that, uh, that NEC was, uh, was just barely um, in first place in terms of, uh, of uh, etiology for short bowel syndrome, mid-gut volvula is second, and the atresia is third, with gastroschisis a poor fourth. But it appears that the epidemiology is changing. Um, the uh, group from UCSF, the surgical group, actually showed that uh, gastros gastroschisis, at least in California, in the California newborn registry, seems to have increased fourfold um, and that there, um, and it's uh, uh, not only most prevalent; it's become the second most common uh, cause of short bowel syndrome. Um, the uh, there are several in utero environmental um, uh, insults that have been described that are associated with gastroschisis, such as young maternal age uh, and exposure of the fetus to agents such as NSAIDs, and uh, more importantly, uh, uh, illicit drugs that that adversely affect. Uh, placental blood flow, uh, such as cocaine and methamphetamine. You know, cocaine, the urban drug of choice, methamphetamine, the rural drug of choice. Um, what contributes to the outcome? I think you have to de decide when uh, gestationally and postnatally the injury occurs, um, what part of the bowel is affected, what the motility is like, whether the bowel adapts or doesn't adapt, and that's the crucial point, whether the bowel adapts, and, and whether uh, other complicating factors, such as uh, cholestasis, infections, and further injury occur. Uh, I will give some of the same discussion that uh, Rob dis, um, uh, did earlier with, with regard to uh, 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 intestinal failure associated uh, liver disease or TPN associated liver disease and I'll discuss both the Boston Children's and our own experience with uh, ethanol locks. Well I think that um, uh, I really probably should there is a more recent article but I still quote Bob Talukian uh, because um, uh, really no one has disputed or discredited the data that he produced um, back in 1983 what he noted was that infants, that these stillborn infants uh, between 19 and 27 weeks gestation had about 120 centimeters of bowel, 115, and the bowel doubled in length by the time these infants were near term. Uh, uh, more recently, a surgical series has confirmed this, that the, the, the absolute numbers are slightly different, but, um, but it appears that the bowel does double in length. Um, and even more recently, um, uh, a paper in, in print in abstract form and not in manuscript form uh, from Argentina has shown that, that term infant uh, small bowel donors have about 250 centimeters of bowel. And adult donors have about 350 centimeters of small bowel. So their adults really grew only about 100 centimeters of bowel between birth and adulthood. Um, the, um, so uh, what is the significance of this? The significance is that the bowel has a capacity to lengthen if a premature baby has had a massive resection, and it doesn't have as much capacity to lengthen if a term baby has had a resection. Um, well, loss of any bowel is associated with 
loss of surface area, with short transient type, and with hypergastrinemia. And this predisposes to peptic ulcer disease. Uh, I think we, those of us who've been around long enough have seen peptic ulcers in, uh, in infants with short gut. Um, decreased pancreatic enzyme activity because the optimum pH for uh, pancreatic enzymes is in the 6 to 7 range. Uh, and if you get the environment too acidic, then the, um, then the pancreatic enzymes will be, uh, will be uh, inactive. Bile salts will precipitate at uh, pH below about 6 and a half to 7, uh, the primary bile acids. Um, and then there's some epithelial damage, and then motility is stimulated. So that suggests that maybe we should, at least early on, um, give uh, an acid suppressant of some sort. Um, there, it's a double-edged sword because the acid suppressants can indeed uh, predispose to bacterial overgrowth. And there have been some, uh, in prematures at least, um, some, uh, some uh, evidence that there may be a predisposition for... Um, for uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, at least a 1.7 times higher risk factor for uh, neck if the baby has been on a PPI. Um, now, if you've lost ileum, I think we all know that bile acids are malabsorbed and that, uh, that B12 is malabsorbed. And uh, so um, one point about short gut syndrome is that bile acid diarrhea is almost never a cause for the diarrhea, or bile acid induced diarrhea, cholerectic diarrhea, almost never occurs in short bowel syndrome. Why is that? Because the pH of the colonic contents is too acid. These bile acids are not in solution. You have to have bile acids in solution for them to exert a cholerectic effect. Uh, now, on the other hand, you do have depletion of the bile acid pool and have steatorrhea on that basis. Um, now, the uh, <coughs> Um, loss of GLP-2 is extremely important, and I think I have a couple of slides on GLP-2. Now, uh, you've already heard about sodium loss. I can't overemphasize the need to measure urinary sodiums. Um, Kathy Schwartz, be before she became a, a uh, hepatologist and when she was over at Cardinal Glennon, collaborated with Jim Keating and wrote a classic paper on, uh, on ileostomy diarrhea and uh, the inability to detect uh, a salt depleted state with, um, with serum electrolytes. They used urinary electrolytes and found that these babies were salt depleted. Soper, the surgeon from Iowa, uh, carried that even farther. He looked at aldosterone levels, and these babies who didn't grow were all hyperaldosteronemic. Um, loss of the IC valve um, is important, um, it's, but it's, it, it doesn't have the huge significance that Doug Wilmer th thought it had in 1974 when we were all using modular formulas. Um, the valve is, uh, it has, loss of the valve has not been associated with, with excessive death, but it has been associated with a more prolonged period on TPN. Um, Spencer, working in Dan Teitelbaum's lab, showed that. On the co you know, the colon was undervalued for a long time, but we do know that loss of the colon results in a loss of a, the colonic break, and, and water and electrolyte absorption is, is abysmal, and there's very poor ability to salvage. I mean, you really can't salvage calories through fermentation um, and production of butyrate if you've lost the colon. Well, the, the components of an adaptation, first of all, we need to make sure that the, the, these babies will adapt, and we have to do everything in our power to facilitate adaptation. Um, adaptation, I think, in, in brief, simply is an increase in surface area and an, an improvement in function. Function actually begins to improve within days of a massive resection. Um, the, uh, histologic correlates may not appear for weeks, though. Um, so you have both an improvement in function and an improvement in um, structure. You have longer villi, uh, but more importantly, deeper crypts, and you have greater cell proliferation. Um, the adaptive process is promoted by both humoral factors and, and luminal nutrients. Um, the um, um, oh, the humoral factor that has received the greatest attention lately has been GLP-2. Uh, it appears that uh, EGF, um, 
uh, has some pro-adaptive response, but doesn't induce hyper-adaptation. It may speed the adaptive response, but uh, adaptation, but the absorptive process is no better uh, when someone gets EGF or when an animal gets EGF than it was pre-resection. Uh, pre um, the um, growth hormone um, issue um, is perhaps still controversial, but I think the majority of studies suggest that uh, human growth hormone has not significantly impacted uh, the adaptive process in, in children or adults. Um, luminal nutrients, of course, are the most important trophic factor, uh, and I think we've gone beyond the, the age when people would keep these kids NPO for, for months and months and months uh, in order to uh, improve fecal output. We know that we'd rather have them malabsorb some and get uh, enough nutrient to facilitate adaptation uh, in this day and age. Um, so we want to prevent the complications of TPN, and what complications do we want to prevent? We want to prevent the catheter-related complications, such as loss, loss of access. What strategies have we used? Well, greater use of PIC lines, at least in-house. Uh, I'm still extremely reluctant for TPN to, give, to send a baby home with a PIC line. Uh, because of significant migration and significant um, risk for, um, for the, the line be, becoming uncapped and, and losing significant amounts of blood. Um, so I prefer a, a cuffed, uh, tunneled central venous catheter for home use. But in the hospital, I think there's no use when a baby is born and spends the first few months of his life in the hospital not to use uh, pick lines within the hospital. Um, what do we do to, to improve um, our sepsis risk, our bloodstream infection risk? Well, one of the things is local line care, the use of the bio patch, and then use of lock therapy. Antibiotic locks have been used, but one of the negative aspects of the antibiotic locks is that the resistance occurs. Um, we want to minimize fluid and electrolyte imbalance and, and abnormal glucose homeostasis, and we want to prevent uh, TPN cholestasis. Um, oh, I guess I don't have the slides. I thought I had the slides of um, of our our um, uh, bloodstream infection rate. Well, you well, I think Mark alluded to the uh, I think Pereira uh, um, study w with the meta analysis on lock therapy. Uh, ethanol lock in our institution, and we presented this at Aspen, um, re was associated with a reduction in bloodstream infection rate in our short gut patients from about eight and a half down to around 2.8 bloodstream infections per thousand catheter days. Um, the Boston Children's Group have published their data and it, uh, their uh, results suggest that they, their rate went from about 10 to two uh, cath bloodstream infections per thousand catheter days. Well, these are soybeans. You know, uh, uh, Mark uh, Mark um, uh, was uh, really uh, brutal on soybeans when he was discussing formulas, um, and I'm going to be just as brutal when uh, discussing um, um, when discussing uh, uh, parenteral nutrition associated uh, cholestasis. Uh, uh, this came from Beth Carter when she was working with uh, Saul Carpin, and it shows that. Um, that phytosterols seem to be one of the putative um, agents that produces the greatest uh, damage to the liver. And what Beth did was look in f uh, cell culture at the effects of phytosterols on the FX receptor. The FX receptor is the major receptor that is associated with, um, with regulation of bile acid homeostasis within the hepatocyte. And when you downregulate it, you get an accumulation of toxic bile acids. So what she showed was that cytosterol was just actually marginally better. It was thought for a long time that cytosterol was the, uh, the offender in, in of those phytosterols, but stigmosterol, and even more importantly, the acetate form, were really profound, profoundly reduced FX receptor. Uh, here are the data that, um, that, um, uh, that Rob mentioned. Um, well, this was the th one of the early studies from Boston Children's where they compared uh, children given um, fish oil-based lipid, omegavin, um, 
at time zero here, and they saw this bilirubin disappearance curve, so that at about 12 or 15 weeks, these babies were all better. And this was compared to, to controls, historic controls, who were getting at least twice as much lipid. These babies were getting a gram per kilo. These babies were getting uh, two or more grams per kilo. And this was, was the bilirubin um, rise in those babies. Well, this is from the COBRA study that, uh, that uh, Rob mentioned. This was the, um, the bilirubin disappearance curve when they cut back to uh, about a half gram per kilo, a gram per kilo uh, every other day. And um, what they found was um, that, um, that the disappearance curve was pretty similar to what they saw, to what the Boston Children's people saw. Um, the uh, negative aspect was that a substantial number of these babies uh, did have uh, essential fatty acid deficiency. I think there were something like um, uh, maybe 15 or 20 percent of them who had uh, uh, trying to tetrines greater than 0 0.2, and then they defined mild deficiency as greater than 0 0.05, and there were something like 40 percent of them who were greater than 0 0.05. None had clinical EFA deficiency. Um, so how do we ad uh, enhance adaptation? Well, we can utilize trophic hormones, we can add soluble fibers, we can block acid, we can supplement with zinc, as Rob and Mark both mentioned. Um, we can give salt to our babies, and we can slow transit down, at least during the early period. If we slow it down too much, then we predispose to bacterial overgrowth. And uh, I have uh, s feelings about bacterial overgrowth. I think it's something that we probably will never eradicate in some of these babies, but you have to facilitate the overgrowth of the right kinds of organisms. Um, well, what about glutamine and growth hormone? A positive effect on adaptation, less impressive results um, than, uh, than Wilmore and Teresa Burns showed, um, and there were no pediatric trials. GLP-2, um, adult trials have shown very promising results. Pelly Jeppesen has been the uh, uh, has been promoting uh, GLP-2 with somewhat missionary zeal, um, and this uh, somewhat complicated slide uh, shows you uh, fluid balance, and this is fluid balance in adult patients getting placebo over a 24-week uh, period. Uh, versus 0.1 milligram per kilo versus 0.05 milligrams per kilo um, subcutaneously of, um, of GLP-2 analog. Uh, it's a deep um, uh, dipeptide, dipeptidyl peptidase resistant uh, form of, uh, uh, of GLP-2 because GLP-2 has a very short half-life if, um, uh, if you don't create an analog that's resistant to the DPP. Uh, so what they showed was those getting active drug had very positive balance, and they were able to reduce their TPN days by about 20 percent, as opposed to those who got placebo who had very minimal effects. Well, what about fibers? Um, you know, this, the short-chain fructooligosaccharides are rapidly hydrolyzed. Inulin is relatively slowly hydrolyzed, uh, and the long-chain uh, oligofructans uh, may have a, a lower concentration of butyrate. Uh, there are two or three studies suggesting uh, that butyrate is maximally produced when you use the shorter chain uh, oligosaccharides. Uh, uh, um, the, and the slow, the more rapid hydrolysis may be important for babies who have short bowel syndrome. Um, the short chain fatty acids will enhance water and electrolyte uh, absorption by upregulating the uh, NHE3, uh, the sodium hydrogen exchanger. They help uh, create an acidic environment, uh, and they are, are used to create uh, butyrate, um, um, which is uh, the fermentation product that's used for energy. Um, so what about the enteral nutrition? What can we do? Why do we need enteral nutrients? Well, we need enteral nutrients because, because the enterocyte needs to have contact with it's apic it needs to have nutrient in contact with its apical surface to be a healthy enterocyte. Um, they promote peristalsis and they si stimulate GI secretions. So how should we feed these babies, continuous or bolus? Um, there are very little data on pediatric short bowel syndrome. There was a paper done back in the 80s by uh, Harry Green 
and uh, Paul Parker, and it, only about half of their patients, there were eight patients, only half had short guts. The other had, others had intractable diarrhea. Susan Ornstein, when she was at Le Bonheur, um, did a study looking at NPO versus continuous feedings in kids with intractable diarrhea and showed that continuous feeding was beneficial. But it was really up to, the, to Jolie and colleagues in Paris to show us that at least adults tend to have better nutrient balance when they get um, uh, continuous feedings. And these are data uh, which are very interesting. They get better balance when they get continuous feeding, but they probably have satisfactory balance if they get at least some of their feedings by mouth and some continuously. Now, this is not perfectly applicable to the pediatric population because, you know, it, these are adults who are feeding ad lib and they're eating a variety of complex nutrients and we're comparing um, polymeric formulas versus, uh, versus food. So it's not a perfect study, but it's very interesting data. What they showed was that, um, the, um, that when you went from oral to tube feeding, your absorption improved of, new, of energy using bomb calorimetry went from about 60 plus percent to over 80 percent, um, and uh, improvement of, um, of protein and fat also was very significant. Um, on the other hand, if you gave combined, you gave half of the calories orally and half of the calories continuously, they found 70 plus percent energy absorption and in fact, um, really excellent fat and protein absorption. So they advocated to give combined oral and enteral feedings in their patients. So what should we use? I guess I'll mention standard, I didn't mention soy, you see, but I mentioned standard formula to condemn it uh, because there's increased permeability to intact proteins, there's dilated intestine, and it, it fosters putrefactive bacteria, bad bugs. They're just, I, I hate E. coli and Klebsiella. Um, the, um, I, I much prefer fermentative bacteria. Uh, I love my anaerobes. Um, Breast milk is very valuable, and uh, and Dorsky in his retrospective review showed that the, the, you know there was a shorter duration of pe uh, parental nutrition in the group of babies who got breast milk. So breast milk is potentially valuable, and maternal breast milk does have some active epidermal growth factor and ap active GLP two. So it and the flora are really the gram positive anaerobes, which are cr are converting these these uh, oligosaccharides and starches to, uh, to butyrate. Well, what about hydrolysates? There's lower antigenicity, there's some MCT, doesn't require bile acids, lower peak bilirubin in the Andorsky study, and what about amino acid formulas? Well, you know, there, it, it's, there's some babies who were weaned from TPN. Most of the studies are anecdotal. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, Julie Bynes um, is, a, um, is a very well-respected investigator from Australia, and she saw m a miracle cure in four patients who couldn't wean from TPN when they were on progestamil. Oops, um, I shouldn't mention any brand names. Uh, and then she put them on, uh, oh, since it's sponsored by Nutritia, she put them on Neocade, and they all got better. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, but there was a, there, clearly in the Andorsky study also, there's a shorter duration of TPN. Um, well, what's the optimal fat intake? Well, we really don't know. Um, m both of the big, form, uh, you know, specialized formula manufacturers uh, who make uh, pr uh, free amino acid formulas, both Nutritia and, uh, and um, uh, Abbott, who, um, who both um, make, um, uh, uh, free amino acid formula have shown, have formulated their formulas to have about 35% MCT, 65% LCT, and really the only data I could find that, that seemed to suggest that this mix was better was an adult study from, again, Pelly Jeppesen and Mortensen that they published in Gut about 12, 14 years ago, where they saw that there was an improvement in water and nutrient absorption, again by bomb calorimetry, of 23 to 58 percent if there was colon, and 46 to 60, nearly 60 percent if there was no colon, if they used about 30, 70 mix. Um, and they gave about 40% of the calories as fat calories. So that's what we have to, upon which to base our nutrition. 
well, what if medical management fails? Well, we can use, uh, as um, Bianchi termed it, the autologous gastrointestinal reconstruction surgery. Uh, it, that's a, it's a pretty fancy name for bowel lengthening, isn't it? Um, it's, uh, he's, uh, well, what could you expect? He's from Malta, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, um, but um, we can also use transplantation. And this is the diagrammatic representation of Bianchi's procedure. Um, it, um, uh, there are many caveats when you have to consider the Bianchi procedure, uh, one of which is if the bowel is too wide, you can only reduce its uh, diameter in by 50%. Um, so if you have a bowel that's 10 centimeters, you're still going to wind up with two loops of bowel that are five centimeters in diameter, so you may still have bacterial overgrowth. His point was not so much to lengthen the bowel in order to uh, increase surface area, although you do increase surface area, um, because you have greater increase in surface area by increasing length than you do by, by increasing diameter. Um, but his point was that you would have better housekeeping and better um, clearance of, of uh, deleterious bacteria. Well, the Bianchi procedure, the, the, one of the reasons that many surgeons have, have um, abandoned it is that you have to split very carefully the two leaves of the uh, mesentery, and if you create vascular compromise, you may wind up with half or no bowel syndrome. Um, and uh, I've seen that happen, which is uh, it's, uh, not a pretty picture. Um, and of course, when he gets his two halves, then he anastomoses them side, or end to end. Most surgeons have abandoned the Bianchi procedure. Um, I think Brad Warner in St. Louis still likes to do a Bianchi procedure because he feels more comfortable with it. And I think the point of the, fa uh, of the matter is that even though a lot of surgeons are doing the step procedure, and this is a diagrammatic uh, uh, for a representation that came directly from the Boston Children's website, um, and um, it was H.B. Uh, Kim who pioneered it with Tom Jaksik as the senior surgeon. Um, what they did was they did serial transverse enteroplasties to create uh, sort of like um, creating a, a little accordion there so that the, the, the bowel could be um, lengthened uh, more tortuous but certainly longer and lower diameter. But what um, HB is important, uh, what Im importantly he points out that you can actually control the diameter according to the, um, the depth of your, um, of your cut with the stapler here. Um, one of the problems is that we have seen patients who become obstructed after this when the first staple line or subsequent staple lines is actually too close to the opposite wall. So we've seen patients who've deteriorated following a step procedure. We've also seen major exsanguinating bleeds if they don't, if they don't uh, suture the apex of the staple line right here. There can be, and you can get perforation as well. So that it's not a totally innocuous procedure. Technically a little bit easier, but boy, it's still not innocuous. So finally, if that has failed, what can we expect from intestinal transplantation? Well, the, the survival has clearly gotten better. There's no question about it. Um, if you look at uh, children and adults um, by era, the um, we're now, you know, we're now around 80 plus percent uh, one-year survival, two-year survival of sort of 70 percent, and then, then it, it goes down from there. Much better than back in the uh, 1990s and even in the early part of the 2000s. Um, but if you look at most of that survival is one-year survival. We've gone from about 60% one-year survival to about 85 to 90% one-year survival. Now, if you do conditional survival curves, that is to say um, you eliminate all patients who died between, um, year, or between time zero and 12 months and look at those who are alive at two years, um, what you find is that if you do liver bowel, this is um, multivisceral with liver, this is liver bowel, this is multivisceral without liver, and this is isolated bowel, you find that there's a significant survival advantage to having the liver, which is what Dr. Starzl preached in 
1987, um, he, that this liver is protective. A lot of surgeons don't believe that. A lot of people feel that now that we're using more rigorous protocols for upfront immunosuppression, we're not going to be seeing that phenomenon. But this is a very impressive difference right here. You have, if you look at, say, 120 months, you know, you're talking about 30% survival. We're talking 10-year survival of 30%, 35% for isolated bowel as opposed to 65% for liver bowel. Um, so uh, this leads us to a dilemma. We're doing a great job. All of you are doing a great job at, in preventing TPN-associated liver disease. So we're going to have more candidates who are, are candidates either because of lack of access or because they're teenagers and are sicker of their lives. Um, and I've actually had a couple of people who've asked. They said, my life is awful. It, uh, as most teenagers say, it sucks. <laughs> it, uh, they, uh, and they want a transplant. And I have to explain to them that there's a, you know, that unless they have an absolute indication, I'm not gonna suggest a, ta uh, a transplant to them, uh, citing these very data. Um, the, um, do you want 10 years of pretty good life yeah, um, or maybe less than that, and a 70% chance that you're, you're not gonna be with us 10 years later. So I think we still have to look at transplantation with um, some, some circumspection. I'm, you know, I'm the medical director of the program in, in Cincinnati, so I'm, I'm in favor of it, but uh, our number of transplants has gone down from a, a peak of about eight, or eight um, three and a half, four years ago, and to three last year. So we're going to be probably doing no more than three to five a year. Um, and probably 75% of ours will be combined transplants. Um, okay, so the principles of management should be to advance your therapy, your nutrition, to use hydrolysates with, you know, with structured lipids, make some physiologic sense. Free amino acids work sometimes when hydrolysis fa uh, fail, and we want to minimize life-threatening complications by protecting the liver and the line and avoiding serious safety events. So here's a case report. Uh, seven and a half month old, born at 37 weeks, in utero volvulus, presented uh, with bilious vomiting the first day of life, and there was a high small bowel obstruction. At laparotomy, she was found to have uh, 45 centimeters of viable intestine, three centimeters of ileum and ICV and a uh, colon and a primary anastomosis was performed. What do you think? You think, uh, I don't know if we have, this one does not have the, uh, the pole. What do you think the potential is for adaptation? Uh, um, I think, a, well, from what I said, a premature has a better chance for adaptation. If you took a 26 week preemie with 40 centimeters of gut, the child would probably be off TPN in eight months. Uh, and that's in fact what our data show. Um, what's in her favor? Well, the fact that she has an ileocecal valve, she fact, and more importantly, colon, she has colon. Um, and so what's the likelihood for adaptation? I can't tell you exact figures on this, but, but the likelihood I would say is, is moderately good. I think she's, uh, she probably uh, has uh, a reasonably good chance. Who, uh, <clears throat> who can tell us better, uh, or who could tell us better from the literature uh, uh, who published something? Well, Judy Sondheimer published something where she looked at, at, uh, <clears throat> at oral intake or enteral intake at, at three months of age. And those who were getting, uh, uh, virtually 100% of those who were getting 75% of their intake or uh, enterally at three months did well. About 50% um, uh, of those who, um, who got 50% of their intake uh, were off TPN within a year. And if they were only getting about 25%, most of them were, uh, were, did poorly. Um, and, oh, this is kind of interesting. I, I'm not sure that this wasn't just an atresia. She came from an outside hospital. Um, you know, most volvuluses, you don't have TI and right colon. Um, mo in most in utero volvulus, you lose more than that. So it's very interesting. Same thing with gastroschisis, where you have atresias you almost only have, almost always just have the left colon. Um, and would most pediatric surgeries do a primary anastomosis? Some do, but probably not. I think many do. I would say the majority tend to, do a, to let the bowel mature. Um, 
unless this was, you know, this was in utero, so it, it may not have, there may not have been much inflammation. If this were neck, I would say they would never do an anastomosis. So I think given the fact that, um, that this was uh, probably clean, sterile, and it was probably the bowel had just been atretic, probably many surgeons would do a primary anastomosis. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, she developed an obstruction and a je jejunal perforation. Uh, so, uh, and then an ileostomy and broviac were placed. And then she was started on TPN and oral feeds with progestamil. And whoop. so how would you feed? This, is, this should be pretty easy. Go ahead. Tell me how you'd feed this child. One, zero. Nobody wants to know, tell me. There we go. Whoa, that's pretty good. Well, that's good. There's really no correct answer. <laughs> no, I, I actually would. I would actually. Um, I would probably give the baby some by mouth. Remember that you know. Again, all the stuff that Ainsley Green did in the 1980s. Uh, yeah, good. That's it, more, yeah, that's it. Uh, well, I think, you know, Ainsley Green did some very good stuff suggesting that by giving some by mouth, you do substantially improve, uh, improve um, secretion of certain hormones, EGF, for example, and, and get the, an insulin surge. And, and so I think, and then the, the adult data from France are suggestive. So. Um, so what kind of formula would you use if the child's failed the... Uh, I guess I would probably t put the child on an amino acid formula. And what kind of laboratory tests? I'd find, follow liver numbers, I'd follow electrolyte, and I'd follow urinary sodium. So, and if the child got all bolus feedings, um, probably wouldn't do so well. Um, so she required hospitalization for hyponatremic dehydration, had another obstruction group poorly, Four months of age, a G tube was placed. Interestingly, she had no G tube, so she was fed exclusively by mouth. And um, would you do a percutaneous gastrostomy? No, probably suggest. They're probably, by this time, the child has adhesions. It's going to be tough. Although, you know, if you see the light, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd be a little cautious. I'd, I'd really push my surgeon. My first surgeon would probably tell me, oh, we can do it. We can do a peg. Um, but um, anyway, I, again, we, we fed her. Um, and she did get a, a um, surgical gastrostomy. I think I prevailed. I think I was a little more vociferous in my argument. Um, and we fed her a combination of oral and enteral. So what would you use now? I think I told you what I would use. So, we can't use breast milk anymore unless it's bank breast milk. And the issue is this pasteurization killed, you know, this, this is deleterious, yeah. So, 100%, okay, good. So, she was started on Neocate, and her caloric intake was 25 calories per, uh, her enteral intake was 25, the TPN provided 62, two grams of lipid, three grams of protein, and two millicovins of sodium per kilo per day. This was actually what she was on at the other hospital and had a gram-negative septic episode. And so what we do we predict will happen? Well, guess what? She continued to gain less than 10 grams a day and became, guess what, jaundiced. Um, she developed a gastric ulcer and her ileostomy output was about 300 milliliters a day. Um, how did we treat the ulcer? Um, well, we, um, we treated it with um, local therapy and with a PPI, and we managed the ileostomy output by actually cutting back on oral feeds and gave her a greater percentage. Because one thing that has been shown is, at least in that Harry Green study, in the Paul Parker study, um, they actually showed that, uh, that uh, you reduced output by about 30 to 40 percent if you gave continuous feeds, especially if you don't have colon. <coughs> Whoops, what, what did I do there? What, what is our poll here? Okay. Okay, it's not loading. <laughs> 
I'm going to ask you for a TPN recipe, and you're going to tell me half a gram or a gram per kilo, right? <laughs> well, she was put on sucralfate also, and, and placed on Actigal. And this was actually at another hospital. So, you know, she would bounce back and forth from, from her ho other hospital. So I didn't put her on any of these things. Um, her ictus was present, jaundiced. And so the usual conjugated bilirubin was six, AST, ALT was 322, GGT 183, INR 1.3. And what, oh, what's her, she had 300, so she had 300 milliliters of ileostomy output. So, so just to, to uh, estimate her stool ileostomy output, well, you figure 80, 80 to 140, maybe 100 milliequivalents per liter. She was putting out 300, so she was losing about 30 milliequivalents. So she needed to get 30 milliequivalents plus her maintenance sodium. Um, will her liver recover? I think so. And does she need surgery? Yeah, she needs a takedown. What other laboratory tests? Urinary electrolytes showed that she was pretty markedly depleted. Um, and with a specific gravity of 1025, you'd expect the sodium much higher than that. Uh, she's very depleted in sodium. Prealbumin was down. Triglycerides were up a little bit. Factors, 63 and 56 percent. So we would think about transplant, but we progressively increased her andral formula, put her on full strength formula, decre increased zinc, decreased copper, added some carnitine. We did add carnitine there. We decreased lipid to a gram per kilo and asked our surgeons to take down the jejunostomy. She improved, average weight gain 35 grams per day, and cholestasis improved. By the time she was getting 75% of her nutrition enterally, her conjugated bilirubin was less than two, came completely off TPN. What do you predict will happen? Well, I, we don't know. Um, but you have to watch out for the landmines of growth failure. Um, there have been studies showing that patients who come off TPN then they have a, a lower adult height than, uh, than counterparts. Um, B12 deficiency, delactate, hyperaminemia can occur. Uh, and that's an interesting phenomenon. We've seen it in a couple of our patients, uh, the hyperaminemia that you see with nutritional deficiency. It's probably due to uh, citrulline and arginine deficiency and, and an interruption in the, uh, in the uh, urea cycle. Uh, they actually look very much like RISE syndrome. Um, they, uh, they get a positive erotic acid, and uh, I mean, I'm, boy, this group is too young to remember erotic acid and Reyes syndrome, but, um, and gallstones. So these are some of the complications. Now eight, no sequelae.